Solo D&D from the 80s. This video is about solo or solitaire Dungeons and Dragons. Just you, no DM or referee, though you can play multiple characters yourself. This is not about single player or one-on-one D&D, where you have a dungeon master running a game for one player. History time! Solo D&D was mentioned as far back as 1975, just a year after the game's release. The first issue of the Strategic Review, TSR's forerunner to Dragon Magazine, talks about how to handle solo dungeon crawls. Let's see. Although it has been possible to play by means of wilderness adventures, a hex crawl with random encounters, there's been no uniform method of dungeon exploring, for the campaign referee has heretofore been required to design dungeon levels. Her. <laughs> Nice English, Gary. You need the DM to design the dungeon you play through, so you don't know ahead of time what it looks like or where the traps and treasure are. To get around that, they've provided a set of roll tables so you can procedurally generate a dungeon as you go. Ha! Rogue stole this! It says that even then, it might begin to get a bit samey, so suggest your friends could design you a scenario and stick it in an envelope. Once you roll up that type of room, like, say, a cave, you open up a cave envelope and follow the instructions. It's kind of play by post without any feedback. You have to remember that these guys were used to playing historical war games, where playing on your own was fairly common. There were hardly any TV shows about historical battles, and books would only give you formations or diagrams with arrows on them showing troop movements. War games were much more interactive, even when played on your own. You'd also play what if games. Pick your favourite battle from history, and then play through it the way you would have done things to see what would happen. What if the Saxons stayed on the hill, or Reno hadn't sat on his hands, or Blucher never arrived? You took them seriously, and you kept records, and you didn't cheat, so it'd be the most fun and challenging for you. We'll come back to this mindset later. What next for solo RPGs? In 1976, after several years of trying, Ed Packard finally got his first Choose Your Own Adventure book published. You read a passage, then you make a choice, which would take you into a new section of the book, and change what happened in the story. While these were aimed at children, the genre and mechanics had a great impact on more serious solo role-playing games that followed. Tunnels and Trolls by Flying Buffalo came out in April of 1975, just after the TSR article, but quickly began supporting solo play. Buffalo Castle in 1976 was the first adventure game book with self-contained rules where you rolled dice. TSR put an introductory solo adventure in one of the editions of the Red Box to help teach the rules. Apparently, a solo module was self-published in Britain sometime around 1977, but I don't know anything else about it. There was also a DMless Judges Guild adventure put out in about 79, but that was kind of it. In 1982, TSR started making the Endless Quest series of gamebooks for school kids. Each one had a set character with a name, class and background. Wizards of the Coast have recently revived the Endless Quest brand with a new series of books aimed at a younger audience. The first fighting fantasy gamebook, The Warlock of Firetop Mountain, was also released in 1982. But unlike TSR's Endless Quest, these books had character creation, game mechanics, and some even had inventory management, which brought things much closer to playing a normal tabletop role-playing game. Okay, so books are fine, but I want proper D&D. Those 80s modules. Aha! Well, TSR actually published seven solo D&D modules from 1983 through to 1985. These ones, in fact. Of these seven, all but one used the basic expert D&D rule set. All of them have maps, multiple endings and introduce new monsters. You can use your own character or a pre-generated one and most have a group variant at the back, so once you've played it on your own you can run the same adventure through for your regular D&D party. Some are more restrictive, some are easier, and all of them use completely different mechanics to try and make them as replayable as possible. This is really inconsistent, but it's kind of interesting to see so many different ways to approach the same problem. In one of the earlier modules, TSR suggests a DM could give a new player the adventure to play through at home, so they could gain a level and catch up with the rest of the group. It'd also give them a bit more backstory and maybe a few magic items, which isn't really a bad idea. You can also definitely see the wargaming mentality at work. These were meant to be taken very seriously. If you died, you died. Start again with a new character. They knew that players were smart, so some have class race restrictions, and new rules for spells and items to stop you gaming them. TSR were also shrewd enough to realise that people would skim through the books to try and find the best outcome, and took measures to make that more difficult to do. They kind of encouraged record keeping, but that meant they had to then come up with different ways to stop info you'd gained on a previous playthrough from spoiling things on a second run. Talking of spoilers, there may be a few, but I'm going to try very hard not to wreck the story of any of these modules if you want to play them yourself. Ready? Let's take a look.
Ah yes, Blizzard Pass. I like the ugly goblins on the cover of this one. This is a basic set adventure for a thief between levels 1 and 3. Like most modules at the time, you get the blue anti-photocopy maps on the inside cover with the classic hatch pattern <coughs> Dyson and a separate booklet with the adventure. Invisible Ink module. Oh yes, to stop you cheating and reading ahead, some of the entries are printed with ink that can only be revealed by colouring over them with the special pen that comes with the game. The copy I have here is actually a pretty mint example, and it still had the pen, which, weirdly, hasn't quite dried up yet. The thing is, the chemical they put on the paper has aged so much that you can't actually reveal it properly anymore. If I get it at an angle, you might be able to see a faint discoloration in the box where the ink was, but you can't really make out the words. Now there is a fan translation I found online, so you can still play it, but it's a bit of a shame. It's a super clever, but probably very expensive and massively over-engineered way to keep the solo story a secret from the player. It's the only module where the first decision you make can result in instant death, which is brilliant and ridiculous at the same time, especially when you read the guidelines at the front. If your character dies, you must roll up a new one. Once you've completed the solo part, you can't do it again with the same character to farm XP. Spoil sports. Ooh, and then there's the hardcore one. If you are using a character from a regular game, be ready to accept that character's fate. It must be removed from the regular game if it is slain in this adventure. No one will rescue the body, no resurrections. The plot's pretty simple. Your thief gets attacked by bandits, you wake up as a prisoner in a dungeon along with some NPCs, and you have to try and escape. There's several different endings, including a lawful one. Bear in mind, this is D&D basic. The evil ending's the best, though. You are now an outlaw and are evil. This makes you an NPC. Give your character to your DM and roll up a new one. What? You play this module for like two hours and survive, which is no small feat for a level one character, and then the book just whips the rug out from under you. Don't be evil, kids. There's some clever ways of using the mechanics, too. You colour in boxes to see if you pass and move silently or open locks check rather than rolling. You also roll to attack with a d20 and use the attack table to see if you hit the right AC. It's not quite Thacko yet, we're only on basic D&D, but it's pretty much the same thing. You don't need to roll damage, the story sections do it for you. If you miss, or make a bad decision, and a monster hits you, you take static amounts of damage, which are given in the text. This adds up very quickly. If you use the pre-gen thief on the back, you only have 7 HP, even with a con of 18. The equipment listed doesn't get used in this adventure, but you could keep it and carry it with the character over to a normal D&D game. The black and white artwork throughout is also pretty decent. The last couple of pages have a group adventure with a slightly bigger dungeon map and full stats for all the monsters if you want to use them in another game. It's a bit weird but I kind of like this one as they've restricted it to thief you can't use magic anyway so they don't bother mentioning it. As you're imprisoned you have to use the weapons you find on the way which gives a good reason for not being able to use a bow or a sling and hit everything from range which would make it easier and also probably more difficult for them to design. I reckon the group game would make a decent old school dungeon crawl for 5e. Basic D&D is pretty easy to modify to work for 5th edition. There's even a conversion chart that you can get from the wizard's website. It's just basically change the monster stats or swap them around and you're good to go. That's Blizzard Pass. Let's try the next one. Maze of the Middling Rhinotaur. Err. Uh, nailed it. This is an expert adventure for any type of character. Levels 1 to 10. How's that work? That's a huge range. There's no way a level 1 character can handle the same things as a level 5, let alone higher. Ah, well, they've been very sneaky this time. The solo version of the maze uses its own diceless combat system to get around the difference into hit and damage. They obviously thought they'd worked everything out, though to be honest, you're still going to get your butt kicked if you've only got a low level of HP. That's probably why all the pregens are level 6. This is another invisible ink module that you reveal as you go. This copy's been played so you can see how it looks like when it's been filled in a bit more. They got a bit brave with this one. Not only do you have to colour in the story entries, but also the map and the combat charts. This is how the adventure works for different level characters. The hero and monsters all have their own attack slash damage tables. Colour in one of your boxes to see if your attack hits and how much damage it does. Then fill in one of the monsters ones. If you do damage, colour in that many boxes to reduce the monster's HP until it goes down to zero. They even have boxes for spells and saving throws. It's actually too clever, because as soon as you fill in all of a monster's boxes, you can't use them anymore. So even though it's more random, it kind of makes it less replayable than Blizzard Pass. As you can play any type of character, there's also a lot more restrictions. Some spells are outright banned, or they work differently, because evil? 
and clerics can't turn undead in the maze because evil, despite the large number of zombies and such. This module is also hard. There are riddles, it's in the title kids, which are actually difficult and some of the monsters it throws at you are crazy. There are a load of minotaurs, a mummy and a chimera and that's not the worst of it. Without the random attack matrix and the lower HP of the monsters in the solo version, there's no way a single character could get through it all. It's a little confusing too, as they've kind of combined the information for the solo and group games in each entry. So the monster's normal stats are listed, but a solo player ignores them and uses the chart instead. There's some great art in this one too. Oh, I like this one with the monsters all queuing up behind the fighter. Plot's still pretty simple. The princess has been kidnapped and is in the maze. Find her and get out alive. Job done. As you reveal the maze, as you go, they try to come up with an excuse for the player metagaming on a second playthrough. This time you're given an owl figurine that magically transforms to full size and takes your map back to the city if you die for the next adventurer to use. It's a bit convenient, but at least they've tried to come up with a story reason for you knowing the answer to the riddles or the treasure locations that you'd already discovered. This module will take longer than Blizzard Pass to complete but gives you more options for characters. The group adventure also introduces wandering monsters and pursuit by evil guards if you don't get a move on in the maze. Again, there's a fan translation of the text but I couldn't find one for the solo combat charts or the map. So if you want to try this one out, you're actually almost better to find a battered used copy like mine so you can actually see the entries. I've also randomly written talking deer heads here but I can't quite remember why. Hmm. The first of three solo adventures by Mel Rasmussen and the first module so far to use solo in its module code. Just look at this cover. Sturges! Sturges front and centre. You don't see that very often. Or ever. We're back to class restrictions on this one. This module is for a level 1 to 3 magic user or an elf, if you're so inclined. If you complete this one, you're guaranteed a level, which I like because in basic D&D, you need a lot more XP to level up a wizard than the other classes. The maps are back on the inside sleeve and they gave up on the invisible gimmick. You just read the entries as you go. This time combat is the same as normal D&D, roll initiative and everything. There's a handy turn order chart for new players to follow which I like. Ghost of Lion Castle is very much an introductory adventure. Everything's explained very well, it explains the magic rules and for fighting in the dark. You can even do variable weapon damage. This time you get a magic journal to write in that goes back to the tavern for the next character if you die. Oh, and this time if you die, your skeleton and items stay in the castle for the next character to pick up. Dark Souls stole this! This module's the first solo story where there are only wandering monsters, but there's no group adventure. The maps are pretty clear though, so you could easily reuse them with a bit of effort. Lion Castle was the home to a powerful wizard and is full of magic and treasure. You draw lots in a tavern to see who will go and explore, and you win? Or should that be lose? Not sure. Anyway, you can explore the outer walls and inside the castle itself to see what you find. Pro tip! Whatever you do, don't go on the roof. My 4 HP magic user got totally wrecked by a baboon. The interior artwork's solid. I like this one looking through the gate, but my favourite's got to be this chubby little orc. He also kicked my bum when I rolled into him. If you're really lucky on monster rolls, you might not actually encounter any at all, as it's only a 1 in 6 chance, but there are plenty of traps to look out for and items to pick up which you can actually use to help you as you go. This one's probably the easiest of the solo modules to pick up and try. If I was going to start anywhere, it'd be here. Arr matey, this be a pirate adventure. Yar. <clears throat> the second Rasmussen module is for a level 4 to 6 character. And this one, <laughs> this one's really interesting, uh, unique and well done. But I'm not quite sure if it's actually D&D anymore. Don't get me wrong, all the pieces are there, but it kind of feels like its own thing. Uh, I'll get on with it, and maybe you'll see what I mean. This be the fir- <clears throat> This is the first adventure to have a named main character in the title. Lathan's an elf whose girlfriend's been held for ransom by an evil baron, and you've got a randomly rolled number of days to get the money together to buy her back. You start with a tiny amount of money to hire a crew, buy provisions, and set sail to the nearby islands on the Sea of Dread to raise the money. It's very much a wilderness adventure in a little sandbox world. You have to do lots of exploring and resource management. You have to keep an eye on your gold, food and how long you've been going. The ship can take damage, you can lose members of the crew or they can mutiny and you can get attacked by pirates or wrecked by a storm. You can even lead or send boarding parties to explore the islands. They've done a really good job of putting it all together on the inside cover of the module. There's also a town where you can hire more people, buy weapons and gamble. You can even get hints and directions if you're stuck. In the port you can choose from several different boats and crews 
Some are cheaper than others, and some are better in a fight. Who doesn't want an all cleric crew, or 72 elves at your command? Combat's not really the focus of the modules, so to keep things fast and easy, it uses hit dice to determine which side wins and loses in a fight. If you're unlucky, you might have to fend off up to 150 creatures at once. Let's do an example. So, you add up all the hit dice of your party and divide it by the number of members to get an average. Um, okay, I have initiative, and I've sent four fighters ashore, and they all have five hit die each, so that gives me an average of five. I look on the attacker chart, four fighters, hit die five, and that gives me a H. Say they attack three skeletons with an AC of seven, and one hit die each, from the wandering monster table. Three and seven on the defender chart gives me a four. We then look at the group combat table. Single is for the player character only. H4 gives me an A. Right. A is all defenders are defeated. We win! Yay! N is no defenders defeated. And the fractions are how many of the group that you're attacking have been killed. If some survive, it's then their turn. They check the attacker chart, and then your team uses the defender chart to see how many of your guys are lost. And you just keep going until one side's defeated. Anyway, as you can see, the mass combat system takes some getting used to, but it is actually very fast compared to rolling loads of dice over and over again. After a while, you can actually judge if you're going to win the fight, and you can also go all in and guarantee victory by sheer numbers. Once you're done with Lathan's quest, they provided five other characters with their own missions to fulfil, like finding a specific place or a type of monster. It even ties into the Isle of Dread adventure, which is nice. It's literally on the map. There are some problems though. It's difficult to play with your own character without pinching the quest from one of the pregens, because otherwise you don't have any purpose. And I don't like ragging on someone else's artwork, but the cover picture isn't very good. The guy with the pole arm seems to have made his ring mail from that sort of plastic thing you get on a six pack of beer. Easily the worst cover of any of the solo modules. This is compounded by the interior artwork, which is all done by Jeff Easley. And it's awesome. Why didn't he get the cover? Some of the choices you make are just better than others. The Sea Steed has a crew of normal men who are admittedly rubbish, but you get 200. The Halfling Boat, meanwhile, only has a crew of 10, and it's only 190 gold less. There's also another issue. This time you have a magic ship's log that records your journey should you die, but that's not all you get. Like Riddling Minotaur, you get a little bird friend, and I use the word loosely. This is Paco. Paco the bloody parrot. It gives hints every so often, and is incredibly sarcastic should the boat sink or you get killed. Cheers, Paco. Why don't we just cook you and run out of rations? I've also spotted the worst dad joke typo I've ever seen in a D&D book. Don't think I wouldn't notice TSR, because I did. Inside cover. Determine your fighting priorities, armor class. Arr, gym lad. Lathan's Gold has a lot of rules, but it kind of needs them with so much going on. It's well worth a look if you want to see how to handle a seagoing voyage, or to take a look at some unusual game mechanics you don't normally see. Ah, a stout dwarven adventure for proper dwarven heroes. This expert adventure is for a level 7 to 9 dwarf. Go through the halls of paradise and rescue the dwarven champion Groner Marblefist. No mucking about. This module's got some interesting features. There's an event record that you cross off as you go, so you don't repeat the same thing, and a runic alphabet that you'll need to translate from Dwarven into the common tongue. I also like how the character sheet has really big boxes compared to all the other modules. It's as if they think Dwarves are stupid. I don't know where they got that idea. I mean, the highest level pre-gen Dwarf, Darrow Blackaxe, has a very respectable intelligence score of, uh, six. Moving on. This time you draw the map as you go. New entries show the size of the room you're in and the ways in and out. It's up to you to plot it all properly so you don't get lost. There is no copy of the full map in this module, so no cheating or checking you've not completely done it wrong. Like Lion Castle, you just read the text, make a choice and jump on to the next. You have to fight your way through the halls using the normal D&D basic combat rules. If you survive and win the adventure, you're ranked based on how you did on the victory record from amateur all the way to living legend, which I obviously nailed on my first attempt. What? Oh, I put the character sheet on my wall, so mighty was my prowess. Uh, no, no, you can't see it. <laughs> Five attempts. <laughs> if you get killed or captured, try again with a new character. You can start at the beginning or where the previous character fell, which is a bit of a time saver, really. Keep throwing in your dwarven red shirts until someone gets through. 
The group adventure returns with a vengeance. You double the number of creatures and shift around some of the bosses, and off you go. If you clear the halls out, you can use it again as a dwarven stronghold, and all of the areas have been renamed in this table. You also get five more adventure hooks if you want your party to return there for a different quest. This is the only module to do this, and is a really good addition. Thunderdelve has a nice Larry Elmore cover of the serpent Frisnaka, Frisnoka, Frisn... whatever. It's got a daft Celtic name. Thunderdale's a pretty good one, especially if you're into dwarves, it's definitely worth a try. I'm just going to say it, I don't like this module. It does have a great Larry Elmore cover of the villainous wizard though, Mystery of the Snow Pearls for the companion set. As soon as you open it up, we've already been downgraded to Mystery of the Snow Pearl. Well, that'll save some time I guess. This one's a bit of a hex crawl, where you have to find, you guessed it, and fight off a cranky pants wizard before he destroys your village. It's just a big fetch quest with a time limit. Here we go. After a run of decent, readable modules, TSR pulls out all the stops to make things more difficult. In an effort to solve the issues of the invisible ink modules, it wears off, what if you lost the pen, how can you replay it after you've revealed everything? TSR decided to put out a module with sections scrambled by a red overlay. The vast majority of the text, whole pages of it, the treasure and the area maps are all printed like this. To reveal it, they give you a tiny slither of red cellophane and it takes ages to get through. This is a very 80s response to an issue they'd already solved by just printing the text and letting the player get on with it. So, I thought I'd come up with my own over-the-top solution. Your move, TSR. The area maps are awful, and like the hex map, which is fine, most of them just have numbers on them, so that you can look at more entries. There's barely any detail, and you can read the numbers without the viewer if you get the angle right. There's only two pictures on the inside of the whole adventure. The other modules had at least four or five, which can really help the imagination of the solo player. You also don't get to use your own character, and there's only one pre-generated one. Kristoff Yetta. No, he's not Russian. He's not even human. He's a level 10 elf. An elf called Christoph Yetter, who's five foot three, <sighs> and he's a pillock. You do get to choose which spells to prepare, which does give you some options, but there are a load of tacked on mechanics that just to get in the way. You have an honour, persistence, and selfishness level, and an XP total. Oh no, it's not experience points, it's a weird fate or luck point system. When you have XP, you can spend it to add plus one to a die roll up to a maximum plus 5. It honestly doesn't add anything to the game though, other than numbers. In theory, you can play this module as a group adventure. The monsters each have a number in brackets that you can use for a group, so rather than one creature, it's now 5. The thing is, all the entries are hidden behind the red stuff. That makes it really difficult and fiddly to run on the fly for other people, without just copying the whole thing out, which would probably be less painful on the eyes. <sighs> there are a few good ideas that stand out among the red mist. There are a few riddles to solve, and unlike in the Riddling Minotaur, you can actually find clues to help you in the environment. You get more actions to do in combat, like evade rolls, thrown weapons, and also like the spell talk feature. On the first round, you can either cast a spell, or you can try and talk to the monster. Some monsters can be spoken to, and that can be used to avoid fights, or find out more information in the story. The storyline itself is okay, but it's the execution of this module that lets it down. Its replayability is mainly due to the aggressively short time limit you have to complete it, rather than anything else. Lathan's Gold did it better. If you find a copy of this in the wild, it's more than likely that the red cellophane, I mean, magic viewer, is going to be missing. Just something to bear in mind. Okay, let's look at the last one. Merle Rasmussen returns with the only solo, sorry, solitaire, Adventure for first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This time it's an urban module. Jeff Easley gets the cover, which is probably my favourite of the lot. It's another Magic Viewer module with entries that need to be revealed, but this one kinda does it right. All of the to hit rolls and combat lists are left alone, so you can see them the whole time. And the entries that are covered are always short, so you can read the whole thing with the tiny viewer without having to keep shifting it around. It's also incorporated into the story. Let me explain. Dagger Alley is an adventure for a single level 4-6 to six character. There are three pre-gens to choose from too, a monk, an assassin and a thief. Each has different quests to fulfil, or you can make your own character and run through one of the missions with them. Find and rescue a princess, find ingredients for a witch's potion, or solve a series of riddles to earn loads of gold. 
It's night time and you're wandering around the dark alleys of the city of Goldstar. The fog has rolled in and it's really difficult to see ahead. You have to use the magic viewer on the map to see through the fog. It's a much bigger, more well put together map of the city. If you climb up a building you can go up to a different level, as far as the roof, or into the basements and dungeons below. The areas are much bigger than Snow Pearl and have been gridded so you can remember what square you're on if you have to come back to it later. And depending on your quest, you actually start at different parts of the map. You reveal symbols as you go, like footprints, wandering monsters or entrances. If you die, like in Lion Castle, your new character can find the body and possessions of your previous one. You don't get stuck with a journal or a book or an annoying parrot. Just try again if you fail, or do a different task. You can even spend some downtime gambling. You can try robbing people, or you can get into brawls. Just whatever you do, don't jump down the well. Trust me on that one. It's Lathan's gold in the city, but without the mass combat system, or having to manage loads of resources. There's only a strip of pictures to go along the top of each page in the book, and there are a couple of restrictions on like flying and digging, but it doesn't really matter for this one. Midnight on Dagger Alley is as open-ended as you'll get from a static solo adventure. You're going to need a magic viewer, but it's less of a chore than Mystery of the Snow Pearl. You will need a decent amount of space to lay out the map though, and they rather stupidly printed it on both sides, which can get really annoying as you have to keep flipping it over when you go to different levels. There isn't a group variant, which is another flaw of the magic viewer system, which is probably why they only did it for two modules. Overall though, Midnight and Dagger Alley has some great ideas, and it's really well put together. The combat's are fair, the city is small enough that it doesn't get boring, and I like how you can go inside the buildings, or just climb up the outside. Right, that's your lot. All the official Dungeons and Dragons solo modules of the 1980s. There are still plenty of second-hand copies floating about if you want to give them a go yourself, but I'll probably still avoid the two Invisible Ink modules, even with the fan translation, they're a bit of a slog to get through. Anything else? Well, you might argue that Rage of the Recaster is a solo module, but I didn't count it because A, it sucks, B, it's from 1993, and C, it's just a series of rooms that you go through one after another, and can also just be played as a group with or without a DM. After that, most adventures for single players were confined to the starter sets, third party content, or Dragon Magazine, like Ghost Tower of the Witchlight Fens, which follows on from the introductory adventure in the 4th edition starter set. Officially, there haven't been any 5th edition modules for solo play, but this hasn't stopped people from hacking the published adventures to make them work for one. There's even a version of Lost Minds of Fandelver. Many new tabletop games, especially on Kickstarter, have been made with solo gamers in mind, or have a way for you to play cooperatively against the game itself. Unlike D&D, other role-playing games have had much more support for the solo player. We've already mentioned Tunnels and Trolls, but the Iron Swan RPG is a more recent example. It lets you play with a DM, in a group without a DM, or solo. There's also plenty of ways to homebrew your own adventures using any system. A lot of people use the Mythic GM emulator to resolve events and play through their own scenarios, despite the rather uh, questionable artwork. I'd recommend taking a look at the Solo Adventurers toolbox on the DMs Guild. If you want to take this further and find out more about solo role-playing games, there's some great solo gamers here on YouTube that I'll link down to below. Have you ever played a solo role-playing game? Was TSR brave or crazy to make these? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in the description box for more content on this topic and subscribe for more Plus One Wisdom. See you next time.